The agenda in the summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The federal leaders are on the hustings. The candidates are knocking on doors. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Election 2021 is underway. And tonight on the agenda in the summer, we'll get caught up on what's resonating so far. While many Canadians slowed down this month for much-needed vacations, federal politicians swung into high gear for an election to be held on September 20th. With just over three weeks to go in the 36-day campaign, let's find out what's top of mind. From Tonda McCharles, senior reporter in the Ottawa Bureau of the Toronto Star, who joins us from the nation's capital. And in beautiful Burlington, Ontario, Laura Stone, reporter for the Global Mail's Queen's Park Bureau. Hi to you both. Hey there. Hello. Hi. Um, so I don't know how many of us had on the pandemic bingo uh, board uh, an election, a snap election, um, and we are facing that right now. Do you think Justin Trudeau has done um, a good enough job to explain why we're going to the poll, Tonda? Look, I think the answer now to that is in the polls that we're seeing, the public opinion polls, and all the surveys are showing a drop in Liberal support um, from the start of the campaign, from even a couple of weeks ago, and a rise in Conservative support. And it doesn't show that Jagmeet Singh is moving a whole lot. But no, it's very clear they've had a really rough start. Um, they think that they've had a better second week. Um, they acknowledge they had a really bad first week, and tr I guess tough is what they, the way they put it to me, tougher than we anticipated. But uh, I think there's no question, you know, they have fought uh, an opponent in Aaron O'Toole, who's a rookie leader, yet has shown himself out the gate to be very disciplined. And that platform launch on day two of the campaign, even the Liberals had to admit they didn't see that coming and was very smart. And Laura? I think the Liberals have struggled to explain the justification for this election. Uh, you know, it was a surprise probably to many Canadians, but in political circles, most of us were expecting this. There had been chatter and rumors for weeks that the Liberals were going to call a summer election, and that's exactly what happened. And yet they seem to be a little bit lost in their messaging and, and in their in their own uh, trajectory of this campaign. I think a lot of that has to do with some of the events worldwide that we're seeing in Afghanistan, for instance, this has completely dominated the first two weeks of the campaign. And so uh, Justin Trudeau is dealing with both, you know, trying to win re-election and trying to win that coveted majority while answering questions with his prime minister hat on about very difficult questions about Canada's efforts to get Canadians and to help out uh, Afghani nationals to come to Canada in this very difficult and tragic situation that we're seeing unfolding on a daily basis in Afghanistan. I want to come back to Afghanistan in a few seconds, but, you know, you said that this was something that in political circles people were talking about. Um, it, it, we're in a global pandemic. We're dealing with the most contagious uh, variant of this pandemic uh, with the Delta, the fourth wave. Uh, people are thinking about going to school, back to school, what that's going to look like for their children. So I wanted to ask both of you, how is the public responding to this snap election? Tonda? Look, I think that um, there's a lot of noise right now. People's lives are dominated by either trying to get a little bit of summer out of what's left and worried about sending their kids back to school. It's on everybody's mind. Um, so I think it, it is affecting sort of the all the parties, but especially the Liberals' ability to put out why they are having the election, to frame it as a consequential, the most consequential ever, they say. Well, look, in most people's lives, the most consequential thing is their health, their safety, their relatives. How are they going to how are they going to deal with kids going back to school amid a Delta variant driven fourth wave when they can't get vaccinated under 12? So, look, I think I think it's a really yes, we saw this coming and to Laura's point, I mean, there was a lot of chatter, but that's because even though it's a pandemic, it was a minority government that faced a, an unprecedented crisis that was coming, sort of looked like it was heading out of it. But 
they they say they've done a lot and they want to do more and they require a democratic mandate for it. But the truth is, it's kind of the life of a minority government anyway. About two years is kind of on average what we've seen in Canada. So, but for the fourth wave, I think there wouldn't be that much questioning of the um, election. And I think it still remains, um, I think, a, a risk for the Liberals. Um, in the coming remaining three and a half weeks of the campaign. You know, uh, if those provinces which are really seeing a rise in cases now, like Alberta, uh, Ontario, um, really can't get a handle on that uh, rising pandemic, it's going to be political. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to be a bombshell in the campaign, just as people are going to the polls. And Laura? I think the Liberals wanted this campaign to be about post-pandemic recovery. I mean, everyone's been talking about a fourth wave coming, uh, so it's not a complete surprise that what we're seeing unfolding is the fourth wave, although we don't really know to what extent that's going to impact hospitalizations, for instance. And Tonda talked about schools going back. That's obviously going to be huge in the minds of uh, many voters across the country. But I do think the Liberals uh, tried to craft a message heading into the campaign and, and the jury's out on how successful they will be on that, but they want this to be about who, which government do you want to steer a Canada through this wave and through the recovery. I think, you know, the first two weeks of the campaign, it is still the summer. People might not necessarily be totally tuned in. I think the campaigns are anticipating uh, a, a real rise in um, in understanding from from the public in the, in the post Labor Day days and when the, the debates happen. But of course, that also leaves the parties with very little time to make their case, particularly with uh, mail-in voting, which is going to be a big part of this election. So the clock is really ticking now on, on, on the parties, and it's a, quite a short campaign. So they, they have to make every moment count. And Laura, you mentioned um, Afghanistan. And uh, before the SNAP election was called, uh, Justin Trudeau was doing very well in the polls, and he was leading. And now we're seeing it turning around, and Aaron O'Toole is leading a few polls. Um, I wanted to get your sense from both of you, from what you've been reporting. Um, Afghanistan happened a, a couple of days after the SNAP election was called. Do you? It, do you think that there's maybe a little bit of regret uh, from the Liberals um, about the timing of, uh, is, say, if Afghanistan happened two days before the SNAP election was called, maybe it might not have been called? Uh, Tonda, I'd like to go to you well, first. Well, you know, look, the election call came on the day Kabul fell, but mm -hmm. that wasn't the first time that it came to the government's attention. And so I think there is still a lot to be known and questions legitimately to be asked about sort of what the government's preparation was. They had been preparing or trying to bring in uh, interpreters and um, other people via immigration measures, but it's deadly bureaucratic, deadly slow. Clearly, it didn't move fast enough. And, you know, we've heard stories about about how CSIS has been flagging that when the Taliban, if the Taliban, if the U.S. pulls out and the Taliban come back, then watch out. So I don't, I don't think this comes as a surprise to them. Um, I think what might come as a surprise to them is, you know, and that's what they've said on the campaign trail, the speed at which it fell, the speed at which the Taliban moved to take control, and the speed of the U.S. withdrawal, and that there was no leeway. So that puts not just Canada, but every other ally in a bind. All of them are having trouble trying to get their interpretation and their families and other people out of Afghanistan. To that extent, it might not politically wound the Liberals to the extent that Conservatives hope it will, because it may be, and this is what the Liberals have told me that they think might happen, is that voters might see the bigger picture and that it's, you know, not just on one party, it's on uh, the speed of this U.S. withdrawal. And Laura? I think once a party gets on to, to the planning phase of an election, it's very difficult to pull that back. Uh, so, you know, whether this had happened two days or a week before the Liberals had planned to call the election, I'm not sure that that would have influenced their timing just because they have to gather staff, they have to start making plans, they're, they're making last minute tweaks to their platform. This really is kind of a full court press exercise. Um, you know, I do agree with Tonda that, that the speed at which the situation completely deteriorated seems to have thrown the government off guard. But, you know, I think it, the, the questions still remain as to what the ballot box issue will be. Afghanistan is certainly influencing the campaign right now. Uh, Mr. Trudeau is getting a lot of 
difficult questions about it. Is that going to be top of mind when voters cast their ballot? Or is it going to be domestic issues like housing and affordability and health care that really end up sealing the deal for whichever party forms government on September 20th. So let's talk about that, what you just mentioned, you know, as far as what matters to voters right now. Um, affordability is something that's been brought up a lot. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, housing costs are um, rising. Laura, you know, have the leaders gone far enough in addressing affordability? I think this has been a big part of the campaign so far. I think you've seen it from, from the NDP, uh, mostly talking about uh, taxing the most wealthy. Both the Liberals and Conservatives have released extensive housing policies. This is the type of issue that gets uh, those kind of suburban uh, middle class family voters to the polls. And those are the kind of swing ridings like where I am right now in Burlington, which is a Liberal riding but has been Conservative in the past that the parties, the, the two major parties, really tend to focus on. And so I think we will be hearing uh, more of that from all of the campaigns, especially uh, heading into the debates on September 8th and 9th. And Tonda, another issue that's uh, come up is uh, the issue of private versus public health care. Um, in a recent article, you quoted Dr. Catherine Smart, president of the Canadian Medical Association, saying, uh, quote, political parties are batting around vague ideas and numbers but have not provided a level of detail necessary on health care. Um, are vague ideas uh, the hazard of election campaigns? Yes, they are, and especially when it comes to an area of government action that's not actually the federal government's, right? I mean, the federal government transfers money to the provinces for health care, and that is where the difference in the philosophies comes here. All, pro all parties, although the Conservatives and the NDP have been more specific, but all parties are promising billions and billions more in health transfers. The question becomes to what extent they're prepared to tie the province's hands for their own priorities. For the Conservatives, it's mental health and addictions. For the NDP, they really want to push on pharmacare, dental care, eye care, and long-term care. The Liberals have set markers down on long-term care, um, and I think there's more to come from them on that, but they haven't pin pinned themselves down to a target or a goal or you know, responding to the province's demands. So look, the Liberals have tried to use health care as a wedge issue, more importantly, against the Conservatives, arguing that the Conservatives really would be sort of on the sly, through the back door, allow privatization to come in and create a two-tier health care system. It's a, it's a tried and true tactic by the Liberals against the Conservatives. But in this case, too, everyone's surprised. Mr. O'Toole has said, yes, I'm interested in innovation, privately led innovation that the provinces might want. To, you know, to help us all out on health care. What Catherine Smart was getting at there is once you open the door, you start draining the good doctors and resources and the money out of the public system, and then everybody suffers. So that's a really technical debate, though, to have in the middle of a campaign. So I'm not sure where that's going to go. Well, I, throughout the pandemic, we've been hearing about how this uh, pandemic has affected women. We've been hearing uh, the word she session and how a lot of women have had to leave the workforce to be at home with their uh, families. Uh, Laura, is is this election where the country might actually be able to get a workable uh, universal daycare system? I think that's going to be a huge issue in this campaign. We heard a lot about it at the beginning and not so much in week two. I think it will certainly uh, be brought up again. And, and that is one of the key differences between the Liberals and Conservative plan. And uh, the Liberals have an advantage here in that they've signed a number of agreements already with provinces. And we heard from Quebec Premier Francois Legault uh, this week on his demands for uh, for the parties. And while he praised the Conservatives, he also talked about the fact that he doesn't want this agreement that, that his government has already signed with Ottawa for $10 a day daycare to increase uh, child care spaces to be ripped up. Uh, while, you know, Mr. O'Toole's party is promising a more of a tax credit system for families that he says would greater benefit low income families. So I do think that this is going to be a major issue and certainly it's something that the Liberals are going to want to continue pointing out because they do have that slight edge and that they're, they're one step ahead here with a number of provinces in signing these agreements while they were in government. And Tonda... Including, guess, including by the way... Uh, including, by the way, with conservative-led governments in Manitoba, New Brunswick, and uh, and basically in Quebec as well. And where they're disadvantaged, the conser federal conservatives in their argument, is that Quebec has done uh, two massive studies on the usefulness of a tax credit, which they've tried out. 
and it shows that it it renders the public daycare system uh, it, it doesn't provide quality care it doesn't create spaces and they are now having to use the money that Trudeau's given them to try and create those regulated spaces so I'm with Laura I think this is a, still a big uh, dif differentiator between the two parties and I think it's going to play a role you're going to see it come back to center stage in the weeks ahead um, I wanted to get your view on uh, from what you've been reporting because I think last summer well last summer we did hear uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, it seemed like everybody was talking about it. And most recently, uh, with uh, the uh, graves uh, the, at the residential schools, it's, it's weird to call them schools, um, in Canada were discovered. Um, but it doesn't seem to be, the, doesn't seem to be very much talk about, I guess, uh, systemic racism. Does this surprise both of you, Tonda? Yeah, it really does. Look at the wrenching, heartbreaking months we just went through as those graves were being discovered of the Indian residential school children. Um, you know, those were riveting moments um, through the summer, I would say like May, June, July, and now it's dropped off uh, the radar. Um, in terms of systemic racism and, and Islamophobia, those don't actually feature as words even in the conservative platform. These are debates I think that you, you you will find coming to the fore as leaders hit certain ridings. We, we've seen it in Winnipeg. We saw it when Jagmeet Singh went to uh, Kawasis. Um, but I sure would like to hear more about it. It's one of those issues that just, it seems to pop up in the House of Commons when there's a crisis, but it really does need to be dealt with on the election trail because what do, what do Canadians, how much, how much money do Canadians want to put to actually answer all those calls to action? That's an important question. And Laura? I think this is where uh, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh um, will try to really differentiate himself from the other leaders. Uh, as Tonda mentioned, he did visit Kawasas First Nation. He's talked more about uh, uh, about Indigenous issues than the other leaders. The other leaders have touched on it, but I would say it's it's primarily been driven by the NDP. Um, so uh, clearly that's, uh, you know, a, a play to the, those more progressive voices. And we've seen Jagmeet Singh really come out hard in his criticisms of the Liberals throughout this campaign, probably harder than we've ever seen before. And calling out what he says is hypocrisy from Mr. Trudeau and his government on many promises that they've made on this front. I think this will play a significant, or significant role in the debates. I expect that there will be a, an entire section, certainly on Indigenous reconciliation. And so I, I do think the public, and I hope that they're paying attention uh, to the debates, because I do think all the leaders will have to answer very difficult questions about where they stand on these issues. We only have a couple uh, minutes left, actually like a minute and a half, but I want to get to two questions in. Um, it's been a really difficult uh, year and a half, and Tonda, you know, uh, Ontarians were hit hard. Ontario's had probably one of the longest lockdowns in the world, um, and school closures, job losses in the country, seat rich uh, in, in our province. Do you think that voter priorities and loyalties have changed uh, during this pandemic? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I think um, we'll see, we'll, we'll try and draw conclusions after the election in terms of what voters put priority on. I thought months ago that the pandemic and the management of it would figure large in voters' minds. But you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm more and more convinced now that voters are less likely to reward the government for doing something they did because they view that as the job of government anyway, and any stripe of government would have done the same. And I think that voters are really looking to see, okay, what are you going to do for me now? It's it's that age-old problem. They don't thank you. They don't reward you for what you did. They want to know where you're going, where you want to take the country. And Laura, I'll, I'll let you have the last 30 seconds. Should Canadians be uh, concerned about voting in a pandemic? Well, I think that that's, that's going to be a very personal thing, and it, it, there'll be a post-mortem on that when we see the voter turnout, if, if it's going to be low, uh, like we've seen in the, Nova Sco the recent Nova Scotia uh, election, for instance, uh, how the, the parties plan to get out the vote. We've heard about the cancelling of on-campus voting, how that impacts the youth vote. So I do think that this is, that this is going to be a really unique time and a really unique test because we really don't know how people feel about it and we don't know how organized they're going to get if they want to mail in their ballots, for instance, uh, ahead of time. So that is kind of one of the challenges for all the parties is to, is to motivate their base and actually get them out, out to the pools. We know there's a lot of news happening and you're both very, very busy and we do really appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule to speak to us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks Thank for having so us. Thank you so much.
Traffic into Canada from the U.S. isn't back to full steam yet after being shut down for much of the pandemic. But for one hitchhiker, the trucks and other vehicles that are crossing may be enough to get a foothold that puts Ontario's wine country in harm's way. With us to explain why the spotted lantern fly is cause for concern, in Hamilton, Ontario, Justin Chandler, Ontario Hub's journalist covering the Hamilton-Niagara region. Hey, Justin. Hey, Ann. All right, so for a lot of people, this is probably the first time that they've heard of the spotted lantern fly. What is it? So this is a, an interesting looking insect. It's, it, it's technically a plant hopper. It's called a lantern fly and it kind of looks like a moth, but when it's fully grown, it's this uh, about three centimeter long, um, bright red bug with, uh, with wide wings. Um, it kind of looks like a Pokemon, I think, a little bit cartoonish. Um, and it, it's an invasive species that's taken a big hold throughout the United States. Now, I got to say, they do look pretty and, uh, dare I say, even cute. Um, but there is a lot of concern. Tell us why is why are, you know, farmers in Ontario and experts in the area concerned about them coming to the area? Well, I'll just say first, I think they look a little bit scary, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> anyway, um, so why people are concerned is essentially this invasive species uh, was first noticed in America in Pennsylvania in 2014. It's thought to have come over in a shipment, maybe from China, where the species is native. And being as it's an invasive species, it doesn't have any natural predators here. Uh, and it eats things that it shouldn't be for our ecosystem. So it really likes this one invasive tree called the Tree of Heaven and it also really likes grapes. So that's been a problem in eastern United States and moving up close to Niagara. So there's worries here because Niagara grows a lot of grapes. So Justin, you had mentioned growers in the Niagara region are obviously concerned. It's obviously one of the biggest employers in the region. Uh, what's the concern when we talk about the actual grapes themselves? Right, so what I, what I learned from the, the Ministry of Agriculture from Hannah Fraser, who's an entomologist there, is that Grapes are something like a $4 billion business in Ontario. And so the worry with these with these bugs is that they can really eat a lot of grapes and they can actually kill the vines. Uh, what Mandy Ennis from the Invasive Species Center said is that wineries can essentially be nuked. That was the word that she used. And she said that in Pennsylvania, for example, just acres and acres of grape vine have been destroyed. So it would mean a winery, if they have an infestation, would either have to just risk losing everything or they'd have to really ramp up their pesticides use, which might be something that they don't want to do. Um, you did touch a little bit about uh, when it first was discovered here in the States. How does the species sort of work its way um, through the borders? So this species is uh, often called like a hitchhiker. So the way that it's been getting around and actually getting through um, quarantine zones, even in the United States, um, is because it lays eggs that are very hard to find. It, it's a pretty mobile insect, so it, it can jump around. But often what happens is after they lay their eggs, they die. So they're, they're being spread often by their eggs. So they're just really hard to find. So they might lay their eggs on vehicles. They might lay them on a shipment of stone that's coming somewhere. And there's something that people could easily miss and then unwittingly transport along with them into a new area. All right, I do have a graphic um, and it shows the life cycle of the insect. Can you kind of walk us through what we're looking at here? Yes, so egg laying starts in September or December, so that's coming up soon. And then they stay as egg masses for quite a while. And as you can see, those egg masses are pretty hard to detect. They actually change color uh, over time. And they look a lot like mud when they're laid on something. So something you could easily miss. Then in the spring, they hatch and they're that uh, little black and white bug in a nymph stage. And then as they get a little bit older, come into July to September, you can see them with that uh, red color. And then they grow into that sort of uh, very noticeable uh, wider wings uh, with that red coloring. Now, looking at uh, that graphic, we can see that we're kind of in that fourth and star to when uh, the wings come out. Um, there is some cause for concern. We're sort of in a perfect storm, shall we say, with uh, where we are in their cycle and uh, with the borders reopening because of the pandemic. Again, the borders opened earlier this month. Uh, what's the concern there? So I've been speaking with uh, several different invasive species experts for uh, the piece that I did uh, to try to really get a sense. And there's a worry right now. I spoke to, for example, Mandy Ennis at the Invasive Species Center, uh, which is an Ontario body up in Sault Ste. Marie. And she said that one of the concerns right now is that 
with the border open again to non-essential travel from the U.S. is that there's just even more avenues for the insect to come in. So travelers are already worrying about doing a COVID-19 screening, waiting in long lines to get into, let's say, Niagara because they want to go to the falls, they want to do a wine tour. So there's the possibility now that an unwitting traveler could also be bringing a lanternfly, maybe on the bottom of their vehicle that they just think is a mud splotch. Um, so it's not that they couldn't have come in before because obviously insects don't respect borders, but uh, now that there's more avenues again. So it's just a, an even bigger risk and even more possibility than we had. So what are we hearing from government and uh, growers in the area to combat the issue? Well, they're all actually working together on this. One thing that they've been saying uh, consistently to me in my piece was that public awareness is really important right now. So an example of uh, one of those collaborations and a public awareness campaign would be that the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and the Invasive Species Centre have teamed up to make uh, material available so that people can learn more about the lanternfly with, uh, with fact sheets. Another one is that the grape growers of Ontario teamed up with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and the Ministry of, on of Agriculture in Ontario um, to actually put out something like 65 of these different lanternfly traps among transportation corridors. And the idea with those is that if the lanternfly gets in, they could try and catch some. But it's also just so that people will see them and then think, oh, what's that? And notice and look up. And then there's some information about uh, the lanternfly on those different traps. Now, uh, when I was looking up spotted lanternfly, I did see some video that uh, you mentioned in your article um, of Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where they are just kind of swarming one campus building and lots of people stomping on them. Uh, is that kind of the way that we should be dealing with it? Or what should people be doing if they notice these flies? Well, I don't know that you shouldn't be stomping on lanternflies, <laughs> um, but definitely the, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, I spoke to one of the specialists there, Christine Viegas, and she said that uh, you should be reporting information uh, to them. So people in Ontario could report to this mapping project that's in the province, but also the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, just anybody can report an insect and then they can come and do an investigation and determine what needs to happen. And there are links for how to do that in my piece. Great stuff. Thanks so much, Justin. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Jay and Jagannathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a good weekend, and Nam, we'll see you again on Monday. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. The agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.